श्री श्री भक्ति विरात स्वयं हर श्री रूपोपारी चाहे विष्णु पर परम हंस फर भजक चार स्तर साथ श्री श्री भक्त सेवाएं गई श्री रूप भक्ति सिद्धांत सरस्वती गोसाई महाराज पर उपारी की आनंद कोट वैष्णव बिंद की इस कांत फाउंडर चाहे सेवाएं गई श्री रूप उपारी की नाम चाहे शिव हरिदास ताकुर की प्रेम से कहो श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु नित्यानंद श्री वैदिक के राधा श्री वासुदेव गौर भक्त बिंद की श्री श्री राधा कृष्ण गोप गोपनाथ श्याम कुंड कुंड गिरी गोपदान की वृंदावन धाम की नवदी मायापुर धाम की गंग माई की त्रिभुन माई की तुलसी देव की भक्ति देव की संकीर्तन यज्ञ की हरिनाम संकीर्तन की श्री श्री राधा गोपी वल्लभ की श्री श्री गौन हिताय की जगन्नाथ पाला देव सुबोध देव की समवेत भक्त बिंद के गोप मनंद होम ज्ञान तिमरंद ज्ञानंजना सुलखय चक्षु उन्मी चाम्यन तस्मा श्री गुरव नम हुकाम करोति वाचल पंगम मंगाते गरीम नमस्ते सरस्वते देवी गौरवाणी प्रचारणे निर्विशेषा शनिवारी हस्त चले सतारणे जय श्री कृष्ण चैतान्य प्रभु नित्यानंद श्री गदार शिवा श्री गौर भक्तवृंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे राम अपॉलोजाइज फॉर नॉट कमिंग इन दी एंड traditional way <laughs> i came through the front door <laughs> yes the traditional way is the back door <clears throat> you didn't answer so i i i got my text you didn't answer me huh i said i'm the worst person to ask what time i'm coming to the temple <laughs> you know how much i don't like receptions <laughs> okay. so i figured it out <laughs> i figured if i come in the front door <laughs> I thought so you would do that. Huh? I thought so. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. Um <clears throat> Good to be here. Although I have to confess I've been a little contemplative today from this ride from Connecticut to Boston because uh it's the same ride I took uh 42 years ago when I learned that Prabhu Pad left from the plant left the planet and tomorrow is his disappearance day. <clears throat> so uh I thought maybe I would speak a little bit about Prabhu Pad since it's his disappearance day tomorrow. And uh Yeah, I was in Hartford on November 14th, 1977. And um there's a particular place it's on the Interstate 84 just before you get to the Massachusetts Turnpike right at the border of Massachusetts. There's uh I think it's Holland Mass in Union, Connecticut. There's a uh, right at the <coughs> I happened to uh I was driving to Boston from Hartford with uh, a few devotees in the car and another van uh of uh devotees we were coming to Boston for uh, I can't remember what it was some event some event we were coming and I was going to be late 
and I pulled over on this um, exit just before entering Massachusetts. There was a payphone there. I think right now it's a it's a, a place where they sell uh, caravans. What do they call them in English? They call them caravans in Europe. I forget what they call them in America. RV, RV recreational vehicles. Vehicles. <clears throat> but it was a it was a garage back then <laughs> where they had a payphone, and I had to call to say I was going to be a little late. So when I pulled over and I got out and went to, called on, on the payphone to the devotee who was the president here at the time, uh, he broke the news to me. Uh, that Prabhupada had left. And at that particular time, many of us, all of us practically, <coughs> were thinking that Prabhupada was going to stay because he kind of indicated that Krishna gave him the, uh, the choice to leave or not leave. And because all the devotees were uh, so much trying to convince him to stay. Prabhupada had, the last we heard, Prabhupada had said, okay, I'll stay. That's the last we heard. <clears throat> and um, anyways, it was a shock to me. I was just reading one, one quote today, Prabhupada was saying in the Srimad Bhagavatam. It says that the, uh, in a purport. It says, figurative, figuratively, the queen is supposed to be the disciple of the king. <coughs> Thus, when the mortal body of the spiritual master expires, his disciples should cry exactly as the queen cries when the king leaves his body. However, the disciple and the spiritual master are never separated because the spiritual master always keeps company with the disciple as long as the disciple follows strictly the instructions of the spiritual master. This is called the association of vani, words. Physical presence is called vapu. As long as the spiritual master is physically present, disciples should serve the physical body of the spiritual master. When the spiritual master is no longer physically existing, the disciples should serve the instructions of the spiritual master. Many of us, of course, were thrown into that. <clears throat> Where were you, Mukta? November 14, 1977. The granny took us up to the mountain. Yeah, I called the granny. Yeah. That's how I found out. I was on Interest 84, huh? I was on the road. Yeah. Prabhupada had actually wanted his disciples to come to Vrindavan. And uh, he wanted as many as possible to come, of course. We weren't told that. <laughs> and uh, I was asked, a granny who was the president at the time, he went to Vrindavan just a month before. And he asked me to stay here and take charge of the temple. So I was staying here and taking, well, he was in Vrindavan. But then he came back a little bit before because we were all thinking that Prabhupada was going to stay for a while when he said, okay, I'll stay. And uh, then I was in Connecticut and I learned when I made that phone call and I cried. I cried like, you ask any devotee, any disciple of Srila Prabhupada, where were you when, when you found out that Prabhupada departed? Everybody knows exactly where they were. It's like, it's like a movie, what, the day the earth stood still? <laughs> Way back in the 60s, there's a movie called the, the Day the Earth Stood Still. For us, that's, that's how it was like. And, uh, <clears throat> and it just so happened that uh, I was in charge of a, uh, in 1977, we had a preaching center. 
uh, in Hartford, Connecticut, in East Hartford, on Silver Lane. And uh, I was in charge of all the new devotees, all the uninitiated devotees. <laughs> and they were all, I was training them up on book distribution. And uh, nobody knew that Prabhupada had left, and they were all uninitiated, and I had to tell them, because they were all, you can imagine, <laughs> everybody was aspiring to be Prabhupada's disciple, and they were all thinking that we're going to get initiated by Prabhupada someday, and then having to tell them Prabhupada left, that fell on me. <laughs> it's quite a... <clears throat> It was quite a uh, shocking. But I don't want to sound too morbid because actually Prabhupada in one lecture on the disappearance day of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, when he was giving a lecture to his disciples, he was explaining how appearance and disappearance for Vaishnava are both the same. <clears throat> and he was ad emphasizing the point that the, in fact, where is it? I think I have it here. Hmm. Yeah, this is, a, this is a lecture. This is a different lecture. He says that uh, as Lord Krishna's appearance and disappearance are all spiritual, transcendental, they are not ordinary things. Similarly, Lord Krishna's devotee, his representative, who is sent to this material world for preaching the glories of Lord Krishna, their appearance and disappearance is also like Krishna's. Therefore, according to Vaishnava principles, the appearance and disappearance of Vaishnava is considered all auspicious. Therefore, we hold festivals took me years to figure out how I was going to hold festivals and take part in festivals. But Prabhupada said it, so I had to learn how to follow his instructions, <laughs> hold festivals. So uh, he says, just like, he says, therefore we hold festivals, just like yesterday we had the disappearance day of his divine grace, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Goswami Prabhupada. So we offer all respects and observe the festival. Yeah. Avi Abhav, Tiro Bhav. And although the Vedas describe the Lord's appearance and disappearance, there is actually no end to his pastimes. Actually, the living entity has no birth or death. And what to speak of Krishna or his devotee, Krishna is the chief living entity of all living entities. So, Prabhupada said that appearance, disappearance, they're both the same. Because for the Vaishnava, who especially one who comes to this world to serve Lord Krishna's purposes, uh, he comes and he says, gives the example just like the sun. The sun appears before our vision, and then the sun disappears in the west, appears in the east, in the same way the eternal living entity, the spirit soul, especially the Vaishnava, who descends to serve Krishna's mission, to preach the glories of Lord Krishna and to awaken the fallen conditioned souls into their eternal nature with Krishna. He also comes to this world, and when he leaves this world, he returns. And uh, therefore, Prabhupada says that Although when the Vaishnava leaves, we may feel lamentation for the loss of the Vaishnava. And there are many prayers. This is the song of Narottam Das Thakur, and he describes it's a song for departed Vaishnavas. That song, Narottam Das Thakur, reveals his inner mood of lamentation, spiritual lamentation, feeling great separation for the associates of the Lord. And he, describes how these associates of the Lord, they've left this world, and he's still in this world, 
and uh, remaining uh, in this world and breaking his head against the stone he uses in lamentation of their departure. So although we may lament the departure when a Vaishnava leaves because we lose his physical association, Prabhupada says that for a disciple there is always association, two forms, his physical, Vapu, the disciple continues to associate with his spiritual master through Vani, uh, which is non-different. Therefore we had to learn how to associate through Vani. And Prabhupada explains also that although we may lament when a Vaishnava leaves because we lose his physical association, for the Vaishnava there's no cause of lamentation. <laughs> there's nothing to lament for the Vaishnava who leaves because what is it? he reasons ill who say that Vaishnavas die when thou art living still and sound. Vaishnavas die to live and in living try to spread the holy name of around. So Vaishnavas don't die. Uh, Vaishnavas continue to render service to the Lord and for those who aren't pure Krishna consciousness we understand that they continue to serve the Lord what why should we lament for the Vaishnava who departs therefore we celebrate we have festivals tomorrow should be a festival I don't know if there is a festival, but <clears throat> actually, I was asked, I, I don't want to make it sound like there was an attempt to be a festival, I was asked if I could be here tomorrow, but uh, I said either tonight or tomorrow, one or the other, because I had other things to do, and I was told, better tonight. <laughs> so I said, okay. <laughs> but uh, festival is celebrating the disappearance, Tirobhav Mahotsava, uh, that the, when the Vaishnava leaves our vision. He may leave our vision just as the sun leaves our vision when it sets in the west, but the Vaishnava is eternally serving the Lord. So that was in 1977, November 14th. I oftentimes remember, and I cite this often, oftentimes, that once there was a conversation with Srila Prabhupada in the early 1970s, and Prabhupada was uh, telling how that uh, every 11 years something auspicious in his life happened. And he was saying how that in 1922 is the year that he first met his son. Uh, his spiritual master in Ultadanga Road that is given, details of that are given in the Prabhupada Lilamrita. Prabhupada was, at that time, uh, he was requested by his friend Narendranath to go see a saintly person, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. Prabhupada was explaining in one lecture that Narendranath had said to him that if you go and if you hear from this great saintly person, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, because Prabhupada said at that time, he said he was very influential. In 1922, he was, what, 26 years old. He said amongst his friends, he was a leader. And whatever he did, others would follow. So his friend Narendranath tried to get him to go see Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, because he was thinking that if, if uh, Abai goes to see Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, then many others will come. They'll follow his example. And when you know that when Prabhupada arrived at Ultadanga Road, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur was sitting on the rooftop. He was speaking to his disciples. And he and Narendra, his friend Narendranath, uh, from a distance, they prostrated themselves in obeisance uh, to the saintly person they saw. And no sooner did they rise than Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur took note of them and uh, said to them right there on the spot, first meeting, you look like intelligent men 
why don't you take Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's message to the West? And <laughs> Prabhupada received his instruction from his spiritual master from his first meeting in 1922. And of course, Prabhupada describes in many of his talks how he was a little resistant to the idea. And he said that first we have to, because he was part of Gandhi's movement, how can we actually take up this mission of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? There's a more important mission that we have to engage in and that India has to get free from the influence of British rule. And Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur at that time gave a very strong argument and convinced Srila Prabhupada that whether this British rule or another rule, these things will come and go. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's mission is urgent and it must be spread now. And therefore, uh, he gave various arguments to convince Srila Prabhupada that that's uh, much more important than a free India is freedom of all living entities from the repetition of birth, death, disease, and old age. And Prabhupada understood at that very first meeting that he had met a great saintly person. And at that point, he accepted Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur in his heart as his spiritual master. And Prabhupada explains, he said, actually, <coughs> Real initiation takes place in the heart, that when the disciple hears through the words of a great saintly person and Krishna manifests through the words of that saintly person, and then he said this is actual connection with the spiritual master. Although formally Srila Prabhupada didn't take initiation until 1933. So it was 1922, his first meeting in 1933, 11 years, which Prabhupada said it was the next very auspicious point in his life when in 1933 uh, uh, he, uh, he took initiation for Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. And as we know that, that Srila Prabhupada was a householder, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur had studied, started his Gaudiya mission, was opening various temples in different places. Prabhupada was, was, although he had taken initiation, he was living outside, he was earning his livelihood, and various times and places he would meet up with members of the Gaudiya Math, and he would assist them in various ways, especially Bihar Sridhar Maharaj, who was his godbrother. And in fact, I think it was in Bombay, I can't remember what year it was, when Prabhupada went to the Gaudiya Mat, the Mat that had been established there. And then uh, he was visiting, and, uh, and then I think it was Bihar Shiddha Maharaj who had told Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, Abhai Babu, why don't we make him the temple president of a temple? And Prabhupada's response was, no, no, let him stay. Let him stay outside. He's, he said, in due course of time, he'll do something very important. And Srila uh, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur knew way ahead of time. In fact, I was reading something very interesting today. It's one of my favorite, favorite stories from a, a book that was written by a god sister of mine. Um, uh, Hare Krishna. Kopa Vrindapal's wife. What's, Mula Prakriti, yes, Mula Prakriti. And uh, she had, she had uh, gathered different stories from different Vaishnavas uh, who had known Prabhupada. And one of my favorite stories from that book that she put, Srila Prabhupada, A Friend of All, I think that was the name of the, name of the book. It was a story by, uh, it was a Nayan, Nayan, Nayanananda Das Babaji. I had met him. He was Prabhupada's godbrother. And uh, he, he was a pujari for many, many years in Navadweep of a deity that Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur asked him to worship. And he lived out his whole life 
just serving those deities uh, until the end of his life. When I had gone and visited him, I think it was in the 80s, I went with a group of devotees, and he was worshiping those deities. But he was a... He's telling a story, uh, and uh, it was recorded. And uh, he was saying the last year that our Gurudev organized and performed Gauramanda Parikram, Mandala Parikram, Thousands and thousands of pilgrims assembled at our Champahati Mandir. That's where he was the pujari at Champahati Mandir. He says there was a whole village of tents in all directions. On the afternoon of the last day, one of our godbrothers had just arrived in Navadweep, having returned from London by boat. He had gone to preach, but had returned without meeting with full success. In the evening, while Guru Maharaj, we're speaking about Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, in the evening, while Guru Maharaj was giving Pravachan, he explained that it was his earnest desire that the teachings of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu should be spread in the Western countries. He told how it was the vision of Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur that this would happen. And it was also the last request of his mother, Srimati Bhagavati Devi, to him before she left this world. Consequently, he had been willing to take the lifeblood of the Gaudiya Math in funds to send devotees there to preach. But so far, these attempts had been largely unsuccessful. At this moment in his talk, I noticed that something very mysterious was happening. Guru Maharaj was looking out at the large crowd of devotees especially in, front, in the front, where all the sannyasis and brahmacharis in red cloth were. Then he turned his head and looked over to his left side, where I was standing. He was looking attentively at someone and became silent for a long moment. I happened to look behind me, so he was looking his way, but he saw that he was looking his way, but he wasn't looking at him, and he was trying to figure out, who's he looking at? So he turned around. He said, I happened to look behind me, and I clearly saw that the person with whom he was making eye contact was Abhai Charanaravinda Prabhu. I thought that they were looking at each other in a special way. Then Guru Maharaj again addressed the audience in front of him and said, but I have a prediction. However long in the future it may be, I predict that one of my disciples will cross the ocean and that devotee will bring back the whole world. I remember this incident and Srila Isi Bhaktivedanta Swami Maharaj truly made it come to pass exactly in this way. End of story. So, <clears throat> Prabhupada, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, in 1933, he initiated him, Prabhupada stayed outside, and even when there was a request for Prabhupada, um, some of his godbrothers to get more involved, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta said, no, let him stay in due course of time. He will do everything. <clears throat> so, uh, that was in, I believe, in the early 1940s. But now, 1933, the next year, 11 years, was 1944. 1944 was when Srila Prabhupada began to Godhead magazine. And uh, although Back to Godhead is not as popular today as it was Back, back when I joined, back when I joined, practically speaking, Back to Godhead was one of the only things we had for distribution. We used to go out, not here, North Beacon Street, that uh, we used to go out every day, and we'd take a, 
we'd all take a case of Back to Godhead magazines with us. And uh, for 25 cents of each, we try to distribute Back to Godhead magazines. Sometimes we may distribute 10, 15, 20, but we take a case. So used to, I think a case had 100, 150 in them. <clears throat> and in those days, we had no vehicles. <clears throat> uh, and um, so uh, we were given a case of Back to Godhead magazines, and we're told that if you want to go someplace, you have to sell some Back to Godhead magazines to get enough money for the subway to go and distribute Back to Godhead magazines. <laughs> so, but although that may have seemed difficult, for Srila Prabhupada, for Srila Prabhupada was going in regularly to Delhi uh, to print Back to Godhead magazines. And uh, not only would he write all the articles, uh, and not only would he type out all the articles, but he would go into Delhi to try to get the paper to, to print the Back to Godhead magazines. And there were times when Prabhupada couldn't keep up with his distribution because he was the only distributor. And he couldn't keep up with the distribution and the printer would say, uh, Abai Babu, you know, how long can I go on printing? I need to be paid at some point. <laughs> and Prabhupada would, you know, would, would, uh, would beg him, please, soon I'll bring, I'll bring in, I'll make, I'll make all payments for it. And uh, he would convince the printer to print the next edition of Back to Godhead magazine. And then Prabhupada used to go on bicycle, and he would go to the tea stalls, and he'd go to different places and meet people and stop. And that's, he was the only distributor of Back to Godhead magazine. So, of course, <clears throat> we would take shelter in stories of, we would, had a difficult time maybe to go out and get subway fare, but Prabhupada would go out by bicycle. In fact, there's one story in, in Prabhupada, the friend to all, I'm not going to have enough time to tell all these things that I wanted to talk about. It's going to be 7 o'clock in five minutes. But anyways, this <clears throat> But there was one story when one person was telling that he would always know when Prabhupada was coming with his Back to God in magazines. But because Prabhupada was riding a bicycle that, uh, that was broken. And whenever he would pedal the bicycle, it would, the chain would hit the, the side and you could hear So whenever you heard of someone coming in a bicycle, he knew it was a Bai Babu coming with, with a Back to Godhead magazine <laughs> to come and to try to convince him to purchase a Back to Godhead magazine. So this is how Prabhupada was distributing on bicycle Back to Godhead magazines. He started Back to Godhead in 1944. <clears throat> 1955, 22, 33, 44, 55. 1955 was the year Prabhupada left his family. <clears throat> Previously, he had come <clears throat> in the early 1950s, uh, and Srila uh, Shila Shira Maharaj describes in one, in his interview, how Prabhupada had, one night, he had come to, uh, he was in Calcutta, and uh, Shira Maharaj was preaching in Calcutta. They, he had, they had some mutt there, and he was there with some god brothers, and Prabhupada came at one o'clock in the morning and knocking on the door. And Prabhupada uh, knocked on the door very loudly at one o'clock in the morning. He was sleeping. And he opened up the door and there was Prabhupada. And uh, Prabhupada was telling Yar Shura Maharaj, he said that Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur came to him in a dream that night. And uh, said in the dream, he said, he told me that I should take sannyas. So I've come to you, you're my friend. He said, please. Uh, at that time, Prabhupada had, you know, he was 
struggling to maintain his family. His business wasn't going so well. He had five children. And, uh, and when he said this to Shiddha Maharaj, he said, please give me sannyas. And Shiddha Maharaj tried to explain to Abhai Babu, he said that he was friends with, with, with the Dei family. Prabhupada was Charan Dei, Abhai Charan Dei. He was friends both with the Dei family and the Moloch family. They used to come to his mat. And he thought that if he gave sannyas to Prabhupada, this could be very complicated for him. <laughs> So he suggested to Prabhupada, although Prabhupada was very determined, he said, why, why, don't you, uh, uh, why don't you prepare internally to take sannyas? He says, sannyas is not simply a change of dress, it's, but sannyas is an internal state of eternal, internal renunciation. He said, why don't you prepare internally and you try to convince your family of what's manifesting in your heart. <laughs> and then come back, and we can consider taking sannyas, uh, giving you sannyas. So then a little time had passed, and then Prabhupada had another dream, and it was also in the middle of the night. <clears throat> and Prabhupada uh, it came again to his godbrother Bhyashita Maharaj in the middle of the night, he knocked on the door. He said, Guru Maharaj has come to me again tonight in a dream. He said, you must take sannyas. He said, I've come to you, please, give me sannyas. And uh, NBR Shira Maharaj, at that time, he said, uh, he said, well, actually, there are different stages of sannyas. He recommended first there's Bahudak, where and then there's other stages where gradually you will leave your family. First you live outside the city and village. Why don't you start with the first stage and in due course of time? And, and Srila Prabhupada said to Shri Maharaj, he said, no, the order has been given. He said, the order has been given and, and it's come from above. I have no choice in this matter. He said, I must take sannyas. And uh, he left. And then uh, the next day, it, he explained that Bharashita Maharaj went next door. There was a whole commotion. Prabhupada, in the middle of the night, he took, took no money, took no clothes, took no possessions, took nothing. He just simply left. <laughs> and. Uh, that was in 1955. <laughs> so that was another auspicious. Of course, he took sannyas in 1958. It took some time before he could take sannyas because he, took, he made many different appeals from his godbrothers to take the renounced order of life. He had contacted Bhakti Vilas Tirtha Maharaj, who at that time was in charge of the Bug Bazar Mutt in Calcutta. Uh, anyways, that's a long story. And it's already after seven o'clock, but I would like to, uh, yeah. I'm gonna. Can I speak a little more? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, he had written to Bhakti Vilas Tirtha Maharaj, and uh, at that time, he was already preparing for his life's mission because he. He received his life mission in 1922. You know, that's, like the, that's why the first book of uh, Prabhupada Lila Mrita is a lifetime of preparation. Because although he received his life's mission and instructions from Srila Bhakti Siddhanta in 1922, it wasn't until much later that he actually left and went to, went to the West. But he took the renounced order of life in 1958. But in 55, he had left his family. And uh, he was trying, made several attempts. He was writing to Bhakti Vilas Tirtha Maharaj, who was his godbrother, who at that time, he was the person who was, who was holding on to all the documents, the legal documents of the Gaudiya Mat. 
and he was making an appeal to Bhakti Vallas Tirtha Maharaj. And there are many letters, the letters are available, where he was writing to Bhakti Vallas Tirtha, please, uh, I'm uh, preparing books in service of Guru Maharaj's mission. I need to print these books in the English-speaking language and go to the, to the West. Will you please, can you provide me some facility and uh, in the Bag Bazar Temple, if you remember, the Bag Bazar Temple was the big temple that was built in Calcutta, and it was that same temple when Shila Prabhupada, which Shila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, when he instructed Shila Prabhupada at Radhakund, he said that much more important than worshiping the deities in the temple is as the publishing of, of transcendental literature. He says, in order to print books, he said, I will simply, if I had to. I would sell the marble in the temple if it was necessary to print books and to distribute books. And he was speaking about the Bug Bazaar temple. He said, ever since, ever since we acquired the Bug Bazaar temple, he said that people were simply fighting who would take which room, who would stay in which room. And so much fighting was going on. He said, better simply to take the money from the marble and publish and print books. And he told that to Prabhupada at Radhakund. <clears throat> so he had written to the Bhakti Vallasa Tirtha Maharaj, who was at that time charged of the Bug Bazaar Temple. And, and Bhakti Vallasa Tirtha Maharaj had written back to Prabhupada. He said, Yo, we have many of Guru Maharaj's books that still need to be published. You speak English, why don't you come? We'll give you a nice, bright room in the Bug Bazaar Temple where you can come and sit and you can work and you can. Uh, and help with Guru Maharaj's books. And uh, in due course of time, after you've become accustomed to living in the temple with the brahmacharis and sannyasis and learn a little bit about renunciation, in due course of time, we can make, be able to consider for you to take to the renounced order of life. Prabhupada, of course, when he received that response, he was a little discouraged, disappointed that his that uh, he tried to make the point that he says, we're all serving Guru Maharaj's mission. Guru Maharaj has given the order. He wants Krishna consciousness to go to the West. He wants his books published in English. He says, I am ready to, to render that service. Please, uh, can you provide some help, possibly some funds to prepare these books in English and uh, provide me a place and, and give me sannyas. He's written again. And, Bhakti Vallas Tirtha Maharaj also gave a similar response, much to the same effect, that uh, more important is what we need to do now, what we need to accomplish now. And if you want to take sannyas, first come in to the temple and live in the temple for some time. So then, of course, Prabhupada understood uh, that uh, he wasn't going to get any assistance from that side. So uh, at one point, he approached his, his god brother Bhakti Pragan Keshava Maharaj and told him about the order that he received from Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. And, uh, and uh, <coughs> then uh, Keshava Maharaj said, oh, you must immediately take sannyas. He understood. You must immediately take some, yes. And so therefore they immediately arranged for uh, Prabhupada to take sannyas. And uh, this was in 1958. It was a godbrother of Prabhupada who was also going to take sannyas. His name was Sanatan Das, I believe, who became Muni Maharaj. And, uh, and because the uh, sannyas ceremony was done very quickly, uh, and uh, in response to Prabhupada's appeal, there were no invitations sent out to the Keshava Gaudiya from the Keshava Gaudiya Math. There were no invitations sent out. There were no people informed. It was a very small sannyas ceremony, and it, you see in, in Lilam Lipa, there's a picture of Keshava Maharaj sitting in the chair. On one side is Muni Maharaj, on the other side is Prabhupada. This is. 1958, when Prabhupada accepted the danda. But it's very interesting at this particular ceremony, 
uh, uh, at the ceremony, although no invitations were sent and only a, a handful of people were present, only a, only a few people who were present understood English. And that was uh, Krishna Das Prabhupada's god, god brother, Krishna Das Babaji Maharaj, who was a very close associate of Srila Prabhupada. Babaji Maharaj was very, very friendly with Prabhupada. Anyone who saw Babaji Maharaj knew that he was a very close friend. So he was, came for the sannyas ceremony. And uh, Narayan Maharaj, he was doing the yagya. And uh, he understood English. And I can't remember who else. I guess I think if Keshava Maharaj maybe possibly understood. But there were only three people who understood English. And then the Keshava Maharaj gave a very short talk. And then he told Prabhupada, now you give a lecture. And uh, Prabhupada, although hardly anybody understood English, English, Prabhupada gave a lecture to everyone present in English, <clears throat> simply to emphasize the point, what his purpose was, and what he was set out to accomplish. Uh, so he gave a, a lecture and he took sannyasa, and as I said, in 1958. But 1950, 22, 33, 44, 55, then 66 was the next time uh, Prabhupada said that, uh, um, and 1966 is when ISKCON was incorporated. Although Prabhupada came to the West in 1965, uh, it was after much struggle, um, many letters, uh, that he had written for help uh, from his godbrothers in India, uh, and despite many letters that had been written, not much help had come, and therefore, with the small handful of devotees, Prabhupada had convinced in Krishna consciousness through his preaching in the storefront, from his first appearance in 1965 and 1966, a few of the devotees got together, he put together a document, and ISKCON was incorporated in 1966. And in fact, it was this ISKCON 1966 document, which was recently being, being uh, it was a court battle, and uh, it was this document that, which was being actually preserved and maintained. It was the very first document, which with the initial sig signatures of 1966, incorporation of International Society for Krishna Consciousness. Then the devotees were discussing this with Srila Prabhupada about how auspicious things happened every 11 years. So then they said to Srila Prabhupada, so the Prabhupada, I guess that means in 1977, you'll finish Srimad Bhagavatam. Because Prabhupada was, uh, uh, was working very hard, as we know, Every night, Prabhupada would get up at midnight. He would take rest. He'd get up at midnight and uh, sleep for two hours and get on the dictaphone. And he was translating Srimad Bhagavatam. And many of us at that time, we were always waiting for Prabhupada's uh, new publications to come out. Uh, Bhagavatam hadn't been finished at that time. Prabhupada had gotten up to, I believe, that the tenth, tenth canto, and many of the publications had been printed, but only up until the beginning of the tenth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. But in the early 1970s, when the devotees first asked Srila Prabhupada, I believe at that point of time, it was only first and second cantos had been published. And in fact, First and second cantos were published here in Boston when we used to have ISKCON Press in North Beacon Street. They were published in chapters at a time. And some of these books I, I used to have, I had a collection here. I don't know what happened to them. But uh, I used to have a collection of these books from ISKCON Press in my room. And uh, uh, 
at some point in time, they seemed to, I guess they turned out to be souvenirs <laughs> for somebody, but uh, they're not there. Uh, but I had uh, maybe about six of them. And uh, they used to be printed in North Beacon Street when we had the printing press in the basement of our North Beacon Street temple. And they were printed one chapter at a time. And that's how Bhagavatam was first. And that was in the early 1970s, first published. Although uh, the first volume of Srimad Bhagavatam was printed, I'm going to guess, I think it might have been 1972, Panamanda, do you remember? No, you came in 73, right? Yeah, 73. Uh -huh. But, uh, so the devotees were saying to Prabhupada, so that means in 1977 will probably be the next auspicious year, Prabhupada, you'll probably complete Srimad Bhagavatam. And Prabhupada said, yes, perhaps. But as we know, 1977 was the year that Prabhupada left us. So, uh, Therefore, uh, we should, for many of us who, who've been, who served Prabhupada and had the great fortune to hear his instructions, to hear his lectures, to meditate on those instructions and in service. And uh, as many of you know, I've told the story, I'm not going to tell it again, obviously, that I, my service to Prabhupada, one particular service I had, was renovating this temple because <clears throat> Prabhupada was supposed to come here in 1975. And uh, I prepared, because I was a carpenter before I came to Krishna consciousness, I prepared these rooms for his arrival in 1975, when he was supposed to come. And, uh, but Prabhupada didn't come. <laughs> he changed his plans at the last minute, just before he was supposed to fly from Montreal to Boston, in 75, and just before he got to Montreal, he received a, uh, a uh, telegram from India that Indira Gandhi, who Prabhupada, with whom Prabhupada was very, very eager to meet to get uh, permanent uh, visas for his disciples who were working in India. Indira Gandhi had agreed to meet Prabhupada. So although Bo Boston was the next stop, when Prabhupada got the telegram, Prabhupada changed his itinerary and immediately went from Montreal to India and never came to Boston. Never saw this temple. And uh, nonetheless, we had the opportunity to render service to him in that way and also to distribute his books for him. And many others who served Prabhupada during his physical presence had to learn in 1977 when he departed the meaning of his words that when the spiritual master leaves, the disciple continues to associate with the spiritual master through the instructions he leaves behind. And uh, tomorrow is this anniversary, it's the 42nd anniversary of his disappearance from his world. And therefore, I chose to speak a little bit uh, about Srila Prabhupada and the importance of the instructions he's left behind. Because as he told us, he said that uh, in his books, he will live for the next 10,000 years. And those who come to this Krishna consciousness movement will give the opportunity to associate with him in much in the same way which we learn to associate with Srila Prabhupada was through his books and through his vani. Uh, we remember, I remember the days when the books would get printed, the Bhagavatams would get printed, and as soon as they would get printed, they would come, the shipment would come to the temple, and then uh, devotees would go out with the next shipment of the Nedis Bhagavatam, unload the books, then we'd open up the boxes and take out, everyone would take out one copy, and we'd all disappear 
into closets and different rooms. And, and uh, that next volume was our next darshan with Prabhupada. And uh, they're still here, those same books. And uh, Prabhupada continues to live and to give us his association for those who wish to take that association in the vani of his instructions in his books, in his lectures, and in his followers. So, uh, we'll stop here. Any questions? You mentioned that you had to uh, bring this message to the aspiring disciples. How, how was it? Like, how what was it like? Yeah, for these people who were waiting. It was the most, one of the most difficult things I ever did in my life. Because I was already breaking up myself. I mean, I don't know. I, I mean, when you give everything, you know, the head the head Prabhupada had left, especially for us who were still on this side of the ocean, who were thinking that Prabhupada said he was going to stay and finish the Bhagavatam, you know. It was very difficult. So, what did I say? I can't remember. I just had to. I just remember preaching for my, for my uh, faith and realization that Prabhupada wouldn't have left if he didn't leave something in place for his movement to continue because that's what he wanted. And. Uh, We had that faith, although at that time nothing was clearly defined. It was on November 1977, and uh, it was very interesting because every, every December we used to have the marathon when devotees would go out and distribute books and, do, and make an increased effort to distribute books in December. And uh, in uh, December of that year, for all of us, throughout the whole movement. That was uh, where we really took shelter, because Prabhupada so made it so clear to us that how important it was that we, uh, we publish and distribute his books. So we distributed more books that year than any other year in meditation on Prabhupada's Vani. And that kept us going. And that's what kept us going. And then in due course of time, then uh, everyone just came to accept that the uh, instructions that Prabhupada had left for those persons whom he said that while in my presence they will be my disciples, but when he leaves they will be and those who come will become their disciples. And that was clear instruction Prabhupada had given. And it, it was documented. And it was, that was how we, uh, at that particular time, that's how we were convinced to continue to serve Prabhupada's mission. So, uh, yes, I had a difficult time. <laughs> 